Hello, I'm Dr. Maurice Dupre, and in this section, we're going to discuss areas of surfaces of revolution and the theorems of Pappas. Surface area of revolution for parametrized curves. If a smooth curve x equal f of t comma y equal g of t comma a less than or equal to t less than or equal to b is traversed exactly once as t increases from a to b, then the areas of the surfaces generated by revolving the curve about the coordinate axes are as follows. First, revolution about the x-axis for the case where y is greater than or equal to zero S, the surface area, is the definite integral from A to B of 2 pi y times the square root of the quantity dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. For revolution about the y-axis, in case x is greater than or equal to 0, the surface area S is the definite integral from A to B, 2 pi x, square root, of the quantity dx dt squared plus the quantity dy dt squared dt. Notice in both these formulas, this quantity appears. The complicated thing is the same. And remember, that is simply ds, a little bit of arc length along the curve. So in effect, the formula is simple, really. Capital S is the integral from a to b of 2 pi y ds when you revolve around the x-axis. And if I revolve around y-axis, it's the integral from a to b of 2 pi x ds. So let me just write this integral from a to b, 2 pi y ds. And here we have integral from a to b, 2 pi x ds. Now, what about the case where I have a graph of a function of x? If I have, for instance, y equal f of x describes my curve, I'll just take the parameter t to be x alone. In that case, dx dt is dx dx, which is 1, and this is dy dx. So in the case where x equals t, you get ds is simply the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity square dx. And likewise, if y equals t, we get the same type of thing, except we would get dx dy here. So it's essential, I just write essentially the same. We're just interchanging x and y. In effect, if you have a curve given where x is equal to g of y, then you've got ds is the square root of 1 plus dx dy quantity squared dy. Okay, so that's the general situation. And now, if I wanted to look specifically at what that results in, in the case where I've got a function f of x greater than or equal to 0 and I want to revolve around the x-axis, remember 2 pi y ds, and the ds is square root of 1 plus the quantity dy dx squared all under the radical dx, or since dy dx is f prime of x, we can say this is the integral from a to b of 2 pi, the y is f of x square root of the quantity 1 plus f prime of x quantity squared dx. Whereas, remember, interchanging the roles of x and y, if the curve is given as x equals g of y, where g of y is greater than or equal to 0, continuously differentiable on the interval c to d, the area of the surface generated by revolving the curve x equals g of y about the y-axis is the same deal. Integral 2 pi x uh, ds, and the ds is square root 1 plus dx dy quantity squared dy, and of course dx dy is g prime of y, the x is g of y, and this becomes the integral from c to d of 2 pi g of y, square root 1 plus g prime of y squared dy. In other words, both these special cases, this, this one and the one for revolving around the x-axis, are special cases of this situation of dealing with parametrized curves. And so just a simple way to remember about the x-axis integrate 2 pi y ds, about the y-axis and a great 2 pi x ds.
All right, now let's use these formulas to compute the surface area of a surface of revolution. So let's compute the surface area for the surface we get when we revolve the curve y equal x cubed over 9 about the x-axis, and here the range of x allowed is x between 0 and 2. So we know then that our surface area s is the definite integral from 0 to 2 of 2 pi times y ds. And so what we have to do is figure out what ds is. y, of course, we just replace with x cubed over 9. And since we're integrating along the x-axis, where ds is going to be in terms of x, x is going to be our parameter. So that means ds is simply the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity square dx in this case. So the first thing we want to do is begin by computing ds, which is the square root of 1 plus the quantity dy dx squared dx. Here our y is x cubed over 9. So that means that dy dx is 3 x squared over 9, or 1 third x squared. So consequently, ds is the square root of 1 plus the quantity 1 third x squared quantity squared dx. Of course, a third squared is a ninth, and we have x squared squared is x to the fourth. So this becomes square root of 1 plus x to the fourth divided by 9 dx. That's our final expression for ds. So now we've got to integrate 2 pi y ds. We know what our limits are, 0 to 2, so let's calculate the integral. So putting in what y and ds are for our integral, for the surface area s equal integral 0 to 2, 2 pi y ds, we have the definite integral from 0 to 2 of 2 pi x cubed over 9 replaces y, and square root 1 plus the quantity x to the fourth over 9, all under the square root times dx, replaces the ds. So that's what we have to compute. Now notice that we can do a substitution here because here we've got x to the fourth in the radical and x cubed outside. So we're going to substitute u equals 1 plus x to the fourth over 9. And in that case, du is simply 4 ninths x cubed dx. Now, we need a 4. We've got the x cubed over 9. We need a 4 out front. And so what we do is just put a 2 here as an extra factor and, and compensate by putting a 1 half out front. So here's our 4x cubed over 9 dx. That's the du. We have a factor of pi to pull out. So we get pi over 2 integral square root u du. We have to fix our limits now. When x is 0, u is 1. And when x is 2, u is 16 ninths plus 1. So our upper limit here is 1 plus 16 ninths. Now, that's pi over 2. The antiderivative of square root u is u to the 3 halves power divided by 3 halves, and of course that means these 2's cancel, and that's to be evaluated between these limits. Well, 1 is 9 ninths, 9 and 16 is 25, so we have 25 ninths for our upper limit. And so that leads to, uh, actually it's fairly simple because the square root of 25 ninths is simply 5 thirds, and so Evaluating at the upper limit gives uh, 5 thirds cubed. So evaluating at the lower limit is just subtracting 1, and that's to be multiplied by pi over 3. And when we carry that out, this easily reduces now to 98 pi divided by 81 as the surface area in this case. 
Now let's compute the surface area of a surface of revolution obtained by revolving about the y-axis. So in this problem on surface area, we're going to revolve the curve given by the equation x equals twice the square root of the quantity 4 minus y with the restriction y being between 0 and 15 fourths. We're going to revolve that about the y-axis. So remember, when you revolve about the y-axis, in effect, the radius of revolution is x. And so the surface area will now be the definite integral from 0 to 15 fourths of 2 pi x ds. And of course, now our ds is going to be easily obtained in terms of y. OK, so our first step then is to calculate ds. So here, ds is equal to square root of the quantity 1 plus dx dy squared, all times dy, and x is equal to 2 times the radical 4 minus y. So with that information, why don't you pause the video and see if you can do the rest. Okay, so x is equal to 2 times the square root of 4 minus y, and so we begin by computing dx dy. So dx dy is equal to 2 times the derivative of square root is 1 over 2 times the square root, 4 minus y, and then multiply by the derivative of what's inside the square root, which is, of course, negative 1. Notice the 2's cancel. And so we have negative 1 over square root 4 minus y. Well, that means the dx dy squared is simply 1 over 4 minus y. And so consequently, ds is the square root of 1 plus 1 over 4 minus y, all times dy. OK, so now. Remember, what we have to integrate is 2 pi x ds. And so here's our ds we just calculated. We're multiplying by x. And so s, the surface area, is 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 15 fourths x times the square root of the quantity 1 plus 1 over 4 minus y dy. Now remember, x is equal to twice the square root of 4 minus y, so we need to put that in for x. So now we get 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 15 fourths of twice the square root of 4 minus y times the square root of the quantity 1 plus 1 over 4 minus y dy. And so naturally what we do is combine the radicals into 1, and then that allows us to multiply 4 minus y times the quantity here. Well, of course, that cancels the 4 minus y here, leaving a 1, and puts a 4 minus y where the 1 is. And so the integrand becomes twice the square root of 4 minus y plus 1 inside the radical, and then dy. Notice that uh, 4 plus 1 is simply 5, and so our integrand is simply square root 5 minus y. This factor of 2 can be taken out. And that becomes 4 pi out front. So that means we've got s is 2 pi times the definite integral from 0 to 15 fourths, 2 square root 5 minus y dy, which is 4 pi times the definite integral 0 to 15 fourths, square root 5 minus y dy. And of course, that's an obvious candidate for substitution. We're going to set u equal to 5 minus y, then du is simply negative dy. Well, that means we'll have negative. We put a negative out front and a negative in front of the dy. We have negative 4 pi, definite integral. Now, when y is 0, what's u? 5. So our lower limit is now 5. And when y is 15 fourths, u is 5 minus 15 fourths. And then here we have square root u du. Now, 
What I like to do when I have a negative sign in front of an integral is simply reverse the limits and drop the negative sign. Let's look at this 5 minus 15 fourths. 5 is 20 fourths. 20 fourths minus 15 fourths is simply 5 fourths. So this will be the integral 4 pi times the integral from 5 fourths to the lower limit becomes the upper limit, 5 u to the 1 half du. Okay, we've done our substitution and simplified the integration. Let's carry out the final integral. So here, s finally is 4 pi, definite integral 5 fourths to 5 of u to the 1 half du. And of course, the antiderivative of u to the 1 half is simply u to the 3 halves over 3 halves. So we have 4 pi u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves to be evaluated from 5 fourths up to 5. Now, a 2 in the denominator of the denominator comes upstairs, making that 4 into an 8. In effect, we have 2 times 4 is 8. And so this is equal to 8 pi divided by 3 times the u to the 3 halves to be evaluated between our two limits. So when we put the upper limit in, we get 5 to the 3 halves and then subtract what we get by putting in the lower limit. So that's 5 fourths to the 3 halves. And after a little simplification, this simply becomes 35 pi times the square root of 5, all over 3 as the surface area for the surface of revolution generated by revolving this curve about the y-axis. Now let's find the surface area of a surface of revolution generated by revolving a curve which is given in parametric equation. So here in our problem of surface area, we want to revolve about the x-axis, and what we want to revolve is the curve with parametric equations x equal cosine t, y equal 2 plus sine t, where the parameter t is restricted to be between 0 and 2 pi. So for revolving around the x-axis, in effect, our radius of revolution is then y, so 2 pi y is the circumference of revolution multiplied by a little bit of arc length of our curve ds, integrating that from 0 to 2 pi. And so we have to begin by calculating ds. Now remember, ds is simply the square root of the quantity dx dt squared plus dy dt squared all in the radical times dt. And here x is cosine t and y is 2 plus sine t. So dx dt is simply negative sine t, and dy dt is cosine t. So consequently, dx dt squared plus dy dt squared is simply sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. And so the entire radical just becomes 1, and ds is simply equal to dt. Well, that's a very nice thing, because now our integral from 0 to 2 pi of 2 pi y ds simply becomes 0 to 2 pi integrating 2 pi y dt. And of course, our y is 2 plus sine t. So we pull out the factor 2 pi and replace the y by its expression in terms of the parameter 2 plus sine t. And so notice then 2 pi times 2 is 4 pi integrated from 0 to 2 pi dt plus 2 pi integral from 0 to 2 pi sine t dt. Well, antiderivative of sine t, that's negative cosine t evaluated from the limit 0 to 2 pi since it's a trig function periodic with period 2 pi. It'll just be 0. In other words, the the value of the antiderivative of both those limits is the same. Consequently, the difference will be 0. 
And the only thing we're left with is the integral dt from 0 to 2 pi, which of course is 2 pi. So we have finally simply 4 pi times 2 pi, which is 8 pi squared. Well, many times when we look at a region, symmetry will tell us where the centroid of the region is, or at least it'll locate it along a line. In these cases, often Pappas's theorem for volumes will simplify the problem of computing a volume of revolution. Pappas's theorem for volumes. If a plane region is revolved once about a line in the plane that does not cut through the region's interior, then the volume of the solid it generates is equal to the region's area times the distance traveled by the region's centroid during the revolution. If rho is the distance from the axis of revolution to the centroid, then the volume V is equal to 2 pi rho times the area A. Here in this picture, I've shown a line L here where you can think of this as being situated in any direction in space. And rho then is the distance from this line L to the centroid, which I've specified as this point, of this region. And think of this region as lying in a plane which also contains the line. Now as that region is rotated around the line, notice the centroid itself sweeps out a circle whose radius is rho, and consequently the circumference of that circle is 2 pi rho. And so 2 pi rho is the distance that the centroid travels, and if the region has area capital A, then Pappas's theorem is telling us that A times the 2 pi rho is equal to the volume of the solid generated when that region is revolved around the line L. Well, let's use Pappas's theorem to find the volume of a torus, or in ordinary language, the volume of a donut. OK, so for this torus, let's revolve the circle with equation x minus 2 quantity square plus y square equals 1 about the y-axis. By the theorem of Pappas, the volume is equal to 2 pi x bar times the area of the circle, where x bar is the centroid of the circle. Well, obviously, the centroid of a circle is center by symmetry. So consequently, we've got a very simple picture. Here's our x and y axes. Here's the circle of radius 1 centered at the point 2 comma 0. There's the centroid. And when I revolve that about the y-axis, it makes this torus or donut-shaped figure. And so, according to Pappas's theorem, its volume, V, is 2 pi times the distance traveled by the, or times the radius here, in this case it's 2, times the area of the circle, well, a circle of radius 1 has simply area pi, so we get 4 pi square for the volume. What would happen if we wanted to make this more general? Suppose I said instead of having a circle of radius 1, we had a circle of radius r. So that would make that 1 instead an r squared. And so here, this little circle here will make it have radius little r. And suppose instead of having the center of our circle at 2 comma 0, we made this a general r. So in effect, this sort of distance from the axis of rotation or the axis of symmetry of the donut, we make that r. Then the distance the centroid travels is 2 pi capital R. And so we have 2 pi capital R times pi little r squared, which is then 2 pi squared, capital R, little r squared for the volume of the torus. Now this radius, capital R, is sort of the, the large radius of the torus, and the little r is the cross-sectional radius. Now let's look at Pappas's theorem for surface areas. When we can easily find the centroid of a curve, Pappas's theorem provides an easy way to get the area of the surface of revolution obtained by revolving that curve about an axis. 
Pappas's theorem for surface area says that the surface area S equals 2 pi rho times capital L, where L is the arc length of the curve, and rho is the distance of the centroid of the arc to the axis of revolution. And what it applies to is the case where we're trying to calculate surface areas for surfaces of revolution. So for instance, if this is the axis of revolution, and here's a little curve here in the plane of this line, in other words, the plane of the curve and the line are all the same, then the centroid of that curve is some point in that plane, but it may not even lie on the curve. But if I can find that centroid, I can calculate the distance of that centroid from the axis of revolution. And then given that I've calculated it and it's equal to rho, then the surface area is simply 2 pi rho times capital L. Well, often we can use symmetry to find centroids of curves and areas of regions. However, sometimes we can turn it around using Pappas's theorem, find the surface area, and use that to find the centroid. Well, let's look at an example. Use the second theorem of Pappas and the fact that the surface area of a sphere of radius A is 4 pi A squared to find the centroid of the semicircle Y equals square root A squared minus X squared. Of course, when we picture this, here we can draw our axes and the circle, the semicircle of radius A, and X varies from negative A to plus A. Of course, we know that the length of that semicircle L is very easy to calculate because it's half the circumference of a circle of radius A. The circumference of the full circle is 2 pi A, so the arc length L is just pi A. Now, symmetry tells us that the centroid of that circular arc is on the y-axis somewhere because the circular arc is obviously symmetric about the y-axis. So it's somewhere here, and we'll call it y bar. Well, from Pappas' second theorem, that's his theorem on surface areas, we know that the surface area we obtain by revolving that semicircle about the x-axis is 2 pi times y bar multiplied by the arc length L, which is simply pi A. On the other hand, we know when we revolve that semicircle about the x-axis, what we'll generate is a full sphere of radius A, that full surface of the sphere, and its area is 4 pi A squared. So we have 4 pi A squared is equal to S. And so that means these two quantities have to be the same. And so now we can easily solve that to find Y bar. Notice we can cancel a's, we can cancel one of the pi's, and we can cancel a factor of 2. So the left side after the canceling becomes 2a. The right side, the 2 is gone, one of the pi's are gone. We've got the y bar, the a is gone, pi is still there, y bar, pi. And so consequently, y bar is simply 2a divided by pi. And so Pappas's theorem has enabled us to calculate the centroid of a semicircle. Now, the centroid of a semicircle is something that you probably won't remember, but we easily remember Pappas's theorem, and we easily remember the formula for the surface area of a sphere. Well, we've worked some problems of computing surface areas for surfaces of revolution, and we've looked at Pappas's theorem for simplifying the computations of volumes of revolution, as well as the simplification of problems of computing surface areas of surfaces of revolution. Remember, symmetry of the, of the region can tell us where the centroid is often, and if the symmetry axis of the region we're looking at is parallel to the axis of revolution, then even without knowing where the centroid is, we can see what its distance 
from the axis of revolution is. And so Pappas's theorem can apply in many cases where we don't exactly know where the centroid is, but we can see what its distance from the axis of revolution is.